expanding terror investigation. Who is the man suspected of planting explosives in New York and New Jersey? Waging war on terror, lawmakers review the battle against ISIS. The UN General Assembly convenes. World leaders push for a more concerted effort to help refugees. And peaceful gathering. Pope Francis greets other religious leaders at the World Day of Prayer for Peace in Assisi. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, September 20th, 2016. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. We are learning more tonight about the man accused of planting bombs in New York and New Jersey. Ahmad Rahami faces attempted murder charges following a shootout with police that left him hospitalized. Federal prosecutors are still deciding what charges he'll face for the bombings that injured 29 people. A bar owner in New Jersey is praised for helping lead police to the suspect Monday morning. I'm from Sikh faith. Uh, we have been taught always stand up against the uh, atrocities, any kind of uh, persecution. So I did what uh, every American would have done and we will be more stronger like this if we do everything together. Investigators say Rahami moved to the U.S. from Afghanistan in 1995 as a child, becoming a naturalized citizen in 2011. He's traveled for extended periods to Afghanistan and Pakistan in recent years and was married to a Pakistani woman. His wife left the U.S. just days before the attacks. Investigators are working with officials in Pakistan and the United Arab Emirates trying to contact her. We're also learning more about the Minnesota mall attacker who was shot and killed by an off-duty officer. Dahir Adan was a recent college student who worked part-time as a private security guard. The Somali native had only an, a minor traffic citation on his record. St. Cloud Police Chief Blair Anderson says they'll comb through every detail of his past. We're getting into the meaty part of our investigation and my directive this morning to my staff was that I wanted to know everything about him from the day he was born until last Saturday. Anderson says there's no evidence yet to substantiate a connection with ISIS. That terrorist group claims responsibility for the knife attack of 10 people. Some members of Congress express concern over homeland security. Jason Calvi is joining us from Capitol Hill tonight with that story. Jason. Brian, we heard from several lawmakers today, all of them praising police for stopping the attacks in Minnesota and in New York and New Jersey. But tonight, senators still have some major questions about what went wrong. The head of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, Ron Johnson, demanded answers from the Department of Homeland Security. He wants them to give lawmakers information about the two accused terrorists and their foreign travels. Colorado Senator Cory Gardner tells News Nightly he also wants those answers. In some of the places that at least I understand from open reports, open source uh, information shows that he was traveling to some places in Pakistan that should have raised some alerts, at least in the eyes of the FBI and perhaps Homeland Security and others who were looking at his return to the United States from Pakistan and Afghanistan. So uh, we need more information. But again, it does show that we have to continue our, our constant vigilance against terrorism to develop a plan against radical Islam and continue to take the fight to them instead of allowing it to come onto our shores. Senators will have the chance to ans ask their questions next week. The heads of the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and the National Counterterrorism Center all testifying next week in the Senate in front of the Senate Homeland Security Committee that was just announced today. Brian. Thank you, Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. And other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. President Obama sees a world divided between cooperation and isolationism on the issue of refugees. Our chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn reports. Lauren. Brian, President Obama outlined his thoughts on climate change, multilateralism, trade, and the refugee crisis. In concert with the Pope's philosophy, he wants the world to do more to care for those 65 million people in the world displaced by war. When it comes to helping refugees, the president called on our better angels to prevail. We have to open our hearts and do more to help refugees. Ultimately, our world be, will be more secure if we are prepared to help those in need. Earlier today, 51 corporations like Facebook, Twitter, MasterCard, Johnson & Johnson, and yogurt maker Chobani 
committed to helping refugees. They want them to gain access to education, employment, and financial services. Their contributions total $650 million. But Donald Trump is opposed to allowing more Syrian refugees into the U.S., citing the growing threat of terrorism inside our borders. We want to make sure we are only admitting people into our country who love our country. Donald Trump Jr. echoed his father's opposition in a tweet today, comparing the Syrian refugee crisis to a bowl of poisoned candy. If I had a bowl of Skittles and told you just three would kill you, would you grab a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. Hillary Clinton called the tweet disgusting. The candy company said Skittles are candy, refugees are people. At the United Nations conference yesterday, the Vatican Secretary of State reiterated the Pope's message of charity. To improve the quality of their life and to address the challenges that emerge in modern forms of persecution, oppression and slavery. The president ended his speech saying all of us can be co-workers with God. The administration announced that it will shelter 110,000 refugees next year. That's up from 85,000 this year. Brian. Thanks, Lauren Ashburn at the White House. The United Nations suspends aid delivery after deadly airstrikes hit an aid convoy in Syria. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon denounces as sickening and savage Monday's attack on the convoy. Moscow denies Russian or Syrian fighters were responsible for the airstrikes that killed 20 civilians. Eight new arrests are made in connection with the July truck attack in Nice, France that left 86 people dead. Paris prosecutors say the Tunisian and French suspects are linked to the attacker, Mohamed Bellel. They were arrested Monday in the southeast of France. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the July 14th attack. Police say Bellel drove a, heavily tr a heavy truck into a crowd of people before being shot and killed by police officers. Two priests are found shot to death in eastern Mexico after reportedly being kidnapped from their parish church Sunday evening. The Diocese of Papantla confirms the violent deaths of the priest from Poza Rica in the Veracruz state. A Vatican news agency says their bodies were found Monday morning alongside a road. Their sacristan and driver, who was also kidnapped, was found alive. Violent clashes between drug cartels are common in the area, but it's not clear why these two priests were killed. Pope Francis joins world religious leaders in prayer for peace at the sacred convent in Assisi. Mary Shovlin covers the Holy Father's visit to the hometown of St. Francis. The Holy Father embraces Christian leaders, rabbis, and imams. They've gathered to pray for peace in the hilltown home of St. Francis. Guests include 12 refugees who fled war in Nigeria, Eritrea, Mali, and Syria. Three Christians from the besieged city of Aleppo are also present. Pope St. John Paul II convened the first interreligious gathering in the Italian town of Assisi in 1986. As Francis follows in his footsteps, the goal today is the same, uniting the world's religions in prayer for peace. For centuries, Assisi has drawn admirers of St. Francis who abandon a wealthy life to preach the gospel. Today, Pope Francis urges people worldwide to make time to pray for peace. Mary is joining us from Assisi where she's with the Holy Father. Summarize the Pope's message today. It's definitely one of peace, Brian, as you can imagine. He's come to pray against a society that is consumeristic to the point of not valuing human life, which of course leads to wars. Just as John Paul, who started these World Days of Peace 30 years ago, was railing against the Cold War and communism, Pope Francis is here to preach and pray against this consumeristic society, individualism that counts human life for nothing, and so the victims of war are not often considered. So here bringing with him all the world's religions with him and the representatives, they're coming together to pray for peace and those forgotten in the conflicts of war. So what is the significance of the fact that there are 400 representatives from the world religions present? It's quite an impressive number, and they've come literally from all over the world. Uh, John Paul, of course, started this back in, in 1986, and they've come in ever greater numbers this time. So the fact that they're here to say no matter what divides us dogmatically, where we might not get along in terms of theology or practice or our conflicted histories with one another, we're united in our concern for peace. Peace is pressing to people all around the world, and that's definitely been the message here. 
the thought is, and you can feel it everywhere here in Assisi, that if we pray together, things can change. And how is the theme for the meeting, Thirst for Peace, been evident in what you've heard there today? Well, one of the most eloquent signs of this entire meeting is not only the representatives from all the world's major religions who are here, it is the presence of refugees and war victims who are here at this gathering for peace. And they have literally run from their homelands in search of peace. So just their sign being here is so eloquent, more than some of the speeches even that one could utter here in Assisi. So this thirst for peace, they're speaking of this thirst for peace. Uh, there was a gospel reading that they reflected on, Christ's words on the cross, I thirst. And so everyone here thirsting for peace and working for peace. And Pope Francis's hope is that as we pray Pray together that thirst will be quenched as peace is restored, hopefully, throughout the world. Mary Shevlin, in a CZ with the Holy Father for EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brian. Coming up, from marriage to family planning, top Catholic scholars defend the church's teaching on human sexuality. And health care mandate, the deadline nears for suggesting a compromise. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday evening for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Tonight is the comment deadline for the Supreme Court case involving the Little Sisters of the Poor. James Capretta focuses on health care for the American Enterprise Institute. He worked in the George W. Bush White House. What's the purpose of this comment period, Jim, and what happens next? Well, when the Supreme Court took the Little Sisters case last uh, year and then decided it earlier this year, they agreed unanimously basically to punt on deciding the question and push it back down to the lower courts to try to force all the parties involved to come to a compromise. The Obama administration has issued this request for comments to try to solicit views of all the litigants, frankly, who are opposing them in court on a possible compromise. So they're going to take all these comments, hear all the parties' uh, views, and then perhaps come out with a further regulatory offer in hopes of settling the case. What might a compromise look like? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the parties have a really uh, big, big difference in terms of how they view this philosophically. I'm not sure it's easy to compromise unless the administration, frankly, gives in. Basically, what's at issue here is forcing uh, these religious parties into cooperating and making available to them, even if it's not through their direct insurance plan, but through another plan, contraceptive coverage. That's what the Little Sisters are resisting and other parties are resisting. The administration, even in this request for comments, announces that's the stated goal, free contraceptives for everybody in America and basically invisible to the individual. They just have to get it for free and no, no requirement on them whatsoever. So it's, it's going to be hard for the religious parties to agree to that. U.S. bishops filed their comments earlier this month. They Do you did. think that will make a difference, what they said? I hope so. I think in their comments they made some very good points. Number one being, this is completely unnecessary. You can do something that doesn't violate our religious freedom rights uh, and move toward the goal you want to have, you, the administration, without this big fight in the courts. And so I think they've made sensible uh, offers along the way to try to extricate everybody from this. The administration, though, has been very, very determined to sort of have, the, have their sort of way in terms of if an employer is involved in offering health insurance, the employee is going to get contraceptive coverage and they're going to, it's going to be invisible to that employee how they got it. And I think that's going to be a difficult uh, bridge to cross. We'll be watching closely. James Capretta, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And hundreds of top Catholic scholars sign a statement defending the church's teaching on human sexuality. Wyatt Goolsby reports tonight demonstrating the real harm done by contraception to women, to relationships, to marriages, and to the family. A group of Catholic scholars say they're standing up for the church's teaching on human sexuality. Speaking at the Catholic University of America, theologians and lay leaders issued a response to calls outside the church to change its position. The most recent challenge comes this week from a Dutch-based group called the Wingard Institute. The organization is lobbying the United Nations with this statement countering the church's position on contraception. They state, the teaching that using artificial contraception is an intrinsic wrong always and everywhere is not revealed, nor has it ever been shown to be essential for the truth of the Christian revelation. John Grabowski, a theologian, says they are wrong. And they see the church's teaching based simply on one understanding of biological laws. They don't understand this as more deeply rooted in the human person in our vocation to love. 
More than 540 scholars have signed on to this affirmation of the church's teaching, and the number is growing. At its core, the document reiterates several important points from Humane Vitae, an encyclical released back in 1968. Catholic scholars often refer to Pope Paul VI, who affirmed traditional marriage and responsible parenthood while opposing all forms of artificial contraception in that landmark teaching document. Mary Rice Hassan with the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington says their goal is to present the church's teaching in a positive light. The church has a beautiful vision for relationships, our relationship with God, male-female relationships, relationships within the family, and because we're human beings, our sexuality is very much a part of that. Hassan says the church's teaching stems from God's love. The challenge now, to help the world understand it. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Wyatt. EWTN senior contributor Dr. Matthew Bunsen is with us. What are these dissenting theologians trying to prove and why are they doing it now? Yeah, well, here we are about a year and a half removed from the 50th anniversary of uh, the encyclical Humani Vitae by Blessed Pope Paul VI. A lot of these theologians, uh, many of whom are retired when you look at the list, see this as their last great opportunity to be heard. The difference, though, is that during the 70s and during a much more difficult time, they sort of commanded the airways, they commanded media attention. As we have seen today, as with that list of 540 scholars that's growing, I know, almost hourly, uh, there is a rebuttal, there's a, a, a refutation of everything that they're actually talking about. And this is one of the most interesting developments about this entire discussion today. All right, so let's put these dissenting theologians on one side and those supporting church teaching. What yeah. strikes you most? What is most immediately striking is that when you read what these dissenting theologians are saying, that this is essentially a 50-year-old failed project. It's a 50-year-old failed movement. They are advocating and advancing ideas that have been refuted and discredited realistically since 1968, since the 1960s. Against them is a set of theologians who really represent sort of the cutting edge of authentic faithful theology. We're, we're really exploring deeply so many of the aspects of the faith, deepening our understanding of the faith. Things like the, the communion of persons, marriage is, as that communion, the theology of the body. So many interesting developments that are faithful to the teachings of the church, but as I said, really help us to explore deeply marriage and sexuality. So they call it a failure. I guess it could be argued that so many Catholics use contraceptives, but that doesn't mean that church teaching should change. Exactly. In fact, this anniversary of the 50th, uh, 50 years after Humani Vitae is an opportunity for us, as, as we've been hearing, to look at this very positively, to look at the prophetic words of Pope Paul VI and to understand why he issued Humani Vitae. And then we can look at the results of those who have not, the, the collapse of demography in the West, of family life, of, of government intrusion in our lives, of forcing contraceptives on us. All the things that Paul VI predicted have come true, but it's also an opportunity to have that positive restatement, to invite these theologians uh, to a dialogue, to understand, yes, here's all that has happened to prove that Paul VI was right. Yeah, at the time in the mid-60s, I was like, oh, really? You know, but now we can look back and say, really? So isn't Humane Vitae even more critical today than it was decades ago? It is absolutely more critical, and this 50th anniversary is going to be that chance to celebrate it, but also to re-educate another whole generation about the truth and prophetic teachings of a great pope. Well, we appreciate the insight of Dr. Matthew Bunsen, our EWTN senior contributor. It's always great to see you, Matthew. Thank great you. Privilege to be with you. Up next, debunking myths, live action's Lila Rose discusses Planned Parenthood and women's health. And the government issues new safety rules for driverless cars. On this Tuesday, September 20th, thanks for joining us this evening for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. In a new online video, pro-life activist Lila Rose dispels the myth that abortion makes up just 3% of Planned Parenthood's business. Live action president Lila Rose joining us by Skype from the San Francisco Bay Area. Lila, why do you call Planned Parenthood's common claim a myth? Well, first of all, their common claim is that 3% of what they do, Brian, is abortion, only 3%. And even Slate has called this the most meaningless abortion statistic ever. 
And the Washington Post, which is not particularly pro-life, as we know, has given us three Pinocchios, saying it's very misleading. And so what we did at Live Action is we unpacked the number a little bit about how Planned Parenthood is misleading and how they're actually the biggest abortion chain in this country committing almost a third of the nation's abortions. That's over 320,000 every year, and yet less than 3% of the nation's pap tests and breast cancer exams. And they get taxpayers' dollars. How does Planned Parenthood try to avoid linking that tax money with the abortions that it conducts? It's a great question. I mean, their whole empire of taxpayer money, which is, again, over half of a billion dollars a year, is built on the lie that they are not about abortion, but about women's health. Because the reality is, Brian, as you know, most Americans are not comfortable with abortion, and they're certainly not comfortable with taxpayer funding of it. So Planned Parenthood tries to veil what they do by saying they're about women's health, and that's what their misinformation campaign is about. And yet when you unpack the numbers, again, less than 3% of the nation's cancer screenings, but over a third or nearly a third of the nation's abortion. So it's pretty clear they're focused on abortion. So how do they get away with repeatedly claiming this without being challenged? And it's a good question. I mean, even Elizabeth Warren, the senator, has said this is only 3 percent of what they do under, you know, during congressional testimony. Their president has said it. And fortunately, it's because they have friends in high places. As you know, in, in the White House, President Obama was reelected with, in part, over $15 million of Planned Parenthood's money in 2012. And in this election, Brian, Planned Parenthood is spending over $30 million. It's crazy, because they know that their entire empire of abortion is built on a house of cards, and they need the political support. That's why this election is crucial. Every election is, but their taxpayer money is on the line, and they know it. Lila Rose, president of Live Action, joining us by Skype from the San Francisco Bay Area. Lila, thanks for your good work. Thank you, Brian. And Wells Fargo CEO John Stump faces tough questions on Capitol Hill about bogus bank accounts. Senator Elizabeth Warren says Stump should resign, return the money he made, and face a criminal investigation. But you squeezed your employees to the breaking point so they would cheat customers and you could drive up the value of your stock and put hundreds of millions of dollars in your own pocket. I want to make very clear that we never directed nor wanted our team members to provide products and services to customers that they did not want. Stumpf apologized for the bank but denied bank management was involved in orchestrated fraud. Wells Fargo employees are accused of opening millions of accounts without the knowledge of customers to meet sales targets. The federal government outlines new safety rules for self-driving vehicles. The Obama administration says self-driving cars have the potential to save lives. They may also give elderly and disabled people new freedom and lead to less congested, polluted roads. However, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration warns Semi-autonomous systems could result in drivers not paying attention. It promises to issue recalls if necessary. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Tonight, we leave you with these moments from the Pope's trip today to Assisi for the World Day of Prayer for Peace. Good night. God bless.